All right, so here's the statement of the chain rule. Um, we want to we wanna consider derivatives of compositions, right? We want to take the derivative of a composition, f composed with g. Um, so chain rule says, as long as you know that the inner function is differentiable at x and the outer function is differentiable at the output for the inner function, right? So f is differentiable at g of x. Um, then the composition will be differentiable at x, right? And the derivative of the composition is given by the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside multiplied by the derivative of the inside, right? So it's a product of two derivatives. So the, the derivative of a composition is a product of derivatives, right? Um, so it's f, in, in a way, it's f prime times g prime. You just have to be careful about where those two derivatives are evaluated, right? Um, and if you think about composition in terms of mappings, like we've sketched it over here, right? You know, what happens when we're composing functions? Well, we, we start with some x that's in the domain of g, right? g takes that x value and it sends it to some number g of x, which ideally should be in the domain of f, right? Otherwise, the composition is undefined. Um, as long as g of x is in the domain of f, f is going to take this g of x and it's going to send it to some other value, f of g of x, right? So one of the things we might do is we might say, you know, what if we, what if we call this g of x, like give it, give it a name, like call it, say, u, right? So then, so then this is like f of u, right? Um, so then, then one way of thinking about what's going on here is you've got, you've kind of got f prime at u times g prime at x, right? So it really is just the product of the two derivatives. It's just that, you know, f has to be evaluated at g of x. f has to be evaluated at u because u is in the domain of f, right? So we don't want f prime of x because x isn't even, you know, in the domain of f. I mean, it might be in the domain of f, but it's not, you know, what we're looking at here, right? x is not the input for f, right? This u, which is g of x, that's the input for f, right? So, you know, when we take the derivative of some function, right, when we calculate f prime of x, right, we're always evaluating it at that same input that we had for the original function, right? f of x becomes f prime of x. Same thing here, right? f, f of g of x becomes f prime of g of x. But there's this extra bit at the end. You also need to multiply by this other derivative, right, g prime. They're the two pieces. Um, so we might try to make sense of why, why do you have this product? Why are there two things going on there? Um, and and there, there are lots of ways to think about this. You can think in terms of, of things like, you know, the textbook has this picture with interlocking gears, right? You can think in terms of gear ratios that if, if you have, you know, so if we think in terms of, of rates, if, if x is changing at a certain rate, and we know, we know the rate at which x is changing, um, we know that g prime is going to kind of give us some idea of, of, you know, for a given change in x, how much u is going to change, right? And f prime is going to tell us for a given change in u, how much um, f of u is going to change, right? And, and so now those rates are, are dependent, right? So the rate at which f of u is changing depends on how u is changing, but the rate at which u is changing depends on how x is changing. And if we want the overall rate of change, we need to multiply the two rates. That's what the chain rule is saying, right? Um, you can sort of see this if you think in terms of like a, a tangent approximation, right? Um, we know that, you know, if we think in, in terms of g, right? So we know that if we had, um, you know, if we had g of x, could be approximated by, you know, g at some point, let's say a plus g prime at a times x minus a, right? This is our tangent line approximation. Um, and so maybe we do this for, you know, x equal to a plus some delta x, right? So then, so then this becomes, um, so we can even do this, right? We could say that the difference, right? Um, sort of the g at a plus delta x, if we bring the g of a over, minus g of a, so that change in g is, well, approximately g prime at a times delta x, right? 
Okay. Um, and then we could say, oh, but you know, what about you know, f, if we think about this f of u, right? So f of u should be approximately, um, and so let's let, uh, if we let b equal to g of a, that particular value, right? So this is going to be f of, of b plus f prime at b times u minus b. And we say, okay, uh, well, what if, um, what if u is like b plus delta u? Well, then we kind of have the same thing going on. We can say that f at b plus delta u minus f at b is approximately f prime of b times delta u, right? But now, here we're sort of thinking of the two functions independently. We want to tie them together. So you say, oh, but, you know, if, um, if we're looking at the composition f of g of x, right, um, if we want this u to be, in fact, g of x, right, then we can think of this as being delta u, right? So delta u is the change in g, right? u is g of x. So this is delta u, right? So then we can say, all right, well, delta u is approximated by this. So this is approximately f prime at b times g prime at a times delta x, right? And with maybe, maybe y is f of x, right? So this is like delta, delta y, right? Okay. So f prime at g times g prime at a times delta x. And here you see the chain rule, right? Because b was, was g of a. So this is f prime at g of a times g prime at a, right? So, there, so you can make sense of it this way. If you think in terms of incremental changes, um, the chain rule sort of pops out, right? Uh, we could get into a proof using the definition of the limit, but actually it turns out that that proof is, is it's a little bit trickier than you might think. And this more or less illustrates the idea, it illustrates what's going on. So I think it's better to kind of have this, this conceptual understanding in any case, right? To understand where things are going from, right? So, so again, the idea is gonna be that a small change in X is gonna produce a change in U. That change in U is gonna produce a change in, let's call that maybe Y equal to F of X, right? And if we wanna know how that change in Y depended on the original change in X, we need to multiply the two rates, right? The chain, you know, how does this change affect that change? How does this change affect that change? We multiply them together to get the overall result. Um, another way to think about this is if you use Leibniz notation, some people like thinking about the chain rule this way. If, if y is equal to f of u, where u is equal to g of x, then we can write dy dx as dy du, that's your f prime of u, times du dx, okay? Um, that's how the chain rule looks in the Leibniz notation. Uh, some people really like this. Um, again, it's another one of these cases where you shouldn't think of these as fractions, but if you do, some fun thing happens, like, you know, you cancel out the du's and you get back over to this side. Um, so some people like that, it helps, it helps them remember things, helps them put everything in place. Um, sometimes if you, if you find that you're getting things wrong with the chain rule, if you're forgetting a part or you're putting things in the wrong place, then sometimes it's not a bad idea to introduce this intermediate variable, introduce this u, um, and, and break it down like this. It's not necessary, but some people find that it helps.